Today we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of the Anishinaabek peoples on whose traditional territory we are meeting. Good evening everyone and welcome to Royal City Mission. Uh, on behalf of the bookshelf, I uh, would like to welcome each and every one of you to what promises to be a very uh, enlightening and inspiring evening. And now our special guest this evening. Uh, Sally Armstrong is an award-winning author, journalist, and human rights activist, a three-time winner of the Amnesty International Canada Award, and she holds 10 honorary degrees, was also a member of the Order of Canada. In her 2019 CBC Massey Lectures Power Shift, The Longest Revolution, Sally illustrates how the status of the female half of humanity is crucial to her collective surviving and thriving. Drawing on anthropology, social science, literature, politics, and economics, she examines the many benefit and beginnings of the role of women in society and the evolutionary revisions over millennia in the realms of sex, religion, custom, culture, politics, and economics. What ultimately comes to light is that gender inequality comes at too high a cost to us all. Please join me in welcoming Sally Armstrong. Make my hair blue. I was going to explain when, um, the tremendous opportunity of being the Massey lecturer. Uh, it is a huge honor. It's also the toughest job I've ever had in my whole life. I've had to deal with the Taliban, I've had to deal with ISIS, I've had to deal with Bamba Ramba, believe me. This one was a job. <laughs> you know what happens is they appoint you in the fall, and they meet House of Nancy Press and CBC and Massey College, and they have a meeting about a topic that's on the minds of the people. And then they choose that topic, and they appoint a lecturer. So the best news for me was they, the topic they chose was women and girls. And I thought, after 30 years of reporting on this topic, at last we're in the zeitgeist. And what happens then is they give you the assignment, and mine was, they said, go back to the cave dwellers. That's the first thing I found out. No one dwelt in the caves, but that's another story. Go back to the caves and find out why were women oppressed in the first place. And how did they manage to sustain that oppression over all these many, 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 many years? And where are women today? And how do they get to tomorrow? So you have seven months to write that book, which is Power Shift. And then you have months to do the editing and fact checking, and all of a sudden it's time to produce five lectures out of the book. And the lectures are delivered in five cities across Canada. And then I get to come and talk to the people I already know, people like you. So it has been the most incredible odyssey of my whole journalistic career. And tonight, I want you to just set us off by giving you an overview of the things that I feel were very important in, in showing where women have been. Because you know, from those delicate handprints on the cave walls, we've all seen those, and we, all, we were told those are made by men. As it turns out, they weren't. About two-thirds of them were made by women and girls. But from those delicate handprints to goddesses in ancient Mesopotamia, and from the political tyranny that came in the guise of a message from God, to the convoluted journey we've all been on to emancipation, the story of women is, in fact, the longest revolution in history. You know, so many times for us, change was in the wind. And, and so many times, the finish line blurred just when we thought we were getting there. And so many times, our hopes soared. But still, from Toronto to Timbuktu, half the world's population are still less than equal. But I can tell you now, there's been a power shift. We're not at the finish line, but there's never been a better time in history to be a woman. And despite the blowback from misguided politicians and leftover chauvinists and hyper-masculine misogynists, women are closer to equality than we ever have been before. But the journey ahead, the one we're embarking on right now, is bound, is bound to be epic and is, is going to affect everything we do, our wallets, our jobs, our very future. Why now? I mean, we've had several waves of the women's movement, which I detail in detail in the book. But this new fourth wave, this is the difference. This is the one that got left off. And as I examined it, it's because in 2012, social media took off. And that social media allowed 
the whole movement to put a new focus on intersectionality, a push for greater empowerment of traditionally marginalized groups, of indigenous women, of LGBTQ, of, of, of women of color, of poor women, of disabled women, of all the women. And they began to realize, and I'm cutting this short because I go into such detail of, of the first wave, the second wave, the third wave. But this was the wave that pulled all of these people together and made them realize that we had to have greater representation in politics and in business if we were ever going to get to the finish line. It was the fourth wave feminists that argued that society would be more equitable if policies and practices incorporated the perspectives of all of the people. You know, earlier feminists fought to shake off the ties that bound them to subservience. Many of you and me remember what we were doing in the 60s around that topic. But this new wave, this calls for justice against discrimination, against assault, against harassment, and it calls loudly for equal pay and for an end to, to um, the violence that we have experienced forever. But it also calls for individual choices over our own bodies, and it has created a clarion call around the world that is, is uh, creating this wave. It's also the wave that created hashtag feminism, hashtag me too, hashtag times up, and it put abusive, powerful men on notice, and by all accounts, it got lift off. You know, the holy grail for social innovators today is knowing how campaigns such as hashtag me too are, are, are going to sustain themselves. How that rise in personal power is going to carry us forward. There's a book called New Power, and it's written by Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms. I was just dazzled by the work these two social innovators did because they show us the difference between old power and new power. And there is a huge difference. <coughs> Old power, they say, works like a currency. It's held by few. Once gained, it is jealously guarded, and the powerful have a substantial store of it to spend. It's closed, it's inaccessible, leader-driven, it downloads, and it captures. Isn't that not the way a lot of us grew up, understanding that that's what power really meant? But new power, which the authors claim is exemplified by the hashtag MeToo <coughs> movement, it operates like a current. The first one is a currency. Gather it all to yourself, keep it to yourself, download it, keep others away from it. The more currency you get, the better you are. But a current is made by many. It's open, it's participatory, it's peer-driven, it uploads, it distributes. It's like water or electricity. It's most powerful when it surges. And the goal with new power is not to hoard it, but to channel it. <coughs> and their conclusion, of course, is that Me Too gave a sense of power to the participants, and that each individual story strengthened that surge for the, of the much larger current. So today, empowerment that, that more and more of us are feeling is taking on everything from date rape to all lingering mores that cling to women the way barnacles cling to ships, and they slow them down and deny them fair passage. But it's also fueling change, enormous, life-altering change. You know, as I started this odyssey, I had just written a book called The Scent of Women, and I thought, gosh, don't I already know what's going on with women? But I got lucky, because all the early data we have from the Stone Age, the Pleistocene, the Paleolithic, was written by anthropologists and archaeologists who were men. And that's okay. Back in the day, the girls probably couldn't get into the school. But anyway, the problem is that those men only examined men. Imagine. They only examined men. We know that, though, don't we? Because medical research today, until only 10 years ago, only examined men because they were afraid that a woman's menstrual cycle would get in the way of what they were doing. So by only examining men, we, we learned a lot about what men were doing. We learned nothing about what women were doing. So Gerda Lerner, who's been hailed as the most influential figure in the development 
of women and gender history says, historical scholarship has seen women as marginal to the making of civilization, as unessential to those pursuits defined as having historic significance. And the problem with that is when you sideline the women, the women therefore become not important, not leaders, not strong, not smart, not capable. And that has influenced our thinking all the way to, did it to today. But now, and this is where I got lucky, women anthropologists and women archaeologists have entered the field, along with many men, but together they're re-examining those old notions, they're reopening those old files, and that's what I was lucky enough to get for the Massey lectures. Because if the prevailing belief was that men were the hunters and women were the gatherers, and it, it's not true, by the way, man the hunter is bogus, there's no evidence to say a woman was not hunting right beside him, it gives us that distorted view of relationships between men and women, and that has influenced the way we interact with each other to this day. So simply put, according to Gerda Lerner, the research is permeated with assumptions, assertions, and statements of fact that are neither objective nor inclusive. Words like man and mankind have always been given to us as an inclusive description, but in fact they're exclusive terms that insinuate hierarchy and bias, and we have lived under those terms forever. What's more, our collective knowledge about the past portrays males as strong, aggressive, dominant, active, and in general, more important than females. <coughs> females, in contrast, were presented as weak, passive, and dependent. And you know, that research, which was mostly done by white Western males, has focused on issues that have a male bias. They focused on leadership, power, and warfare. The consequences are so far-reaching that it's fair today to say that today's status of women is a direct result of yesterday's interpretations. There's a, a researcher called Amanda Foreman. She's a, a an historian um, and did a piece for the BBC called The Scent of Women, same title as my book. And she said, the hard truth is that in almost every civilization, Women have been deemed the secondary sex. It's an idea that has become so ingrained, it's been written into history as a biological truth. But you know what? The financial and emotional cost of that truth is staggering. The worldwide cost of violence against women is 2% of the GDP. That's $1.5 trillion, about the size of the whole economy of Canada. But you know, for you and I, there are other consequences. There are other consequences to sidelining half of the world's population. Now, I mentioned medical tests. You and I remember, it was about 10 years ago, that the doctors, or doctors and researchers, doing um, research on strokes and heart disease, then they realized 10 years ago, not very long ago, that women have different symptoms of a stroke and heart attack than men. And therefore, they have different treatments. But, but it was never even considered before. I mean, is it not astonishing? So quick, take this test. If I say to you, doctor, lawyer, politician, scientist, CEO, what do you see? Most people say they saw a man. Or take this one. Picture these gender neutral words. Participant, user, researcher. Who do you see? Most of us say we saw a man. And the simple truth is that the data we use for everything, from medical tests to vehicle safety to office temperatures, I'm going to tell you about that, to snow removal, is hopelessly biased. 